Hey guys, in this week's episode, we are reviewing Edgar Wright's newest film, Last Night in Soho. But before that, we're talking uh, his first documentary, The Sparks Brothers, Eternals, and The French Dispatch. Join us! Hello and welcome to the Casual Cinecast, powered by Cinelinks. My name is Chris, and with me as always is Mike. If you were able to time travel to observe a time period, what time period would you observe? Well, you know, it would have been the 60s, but now I'm rethinking that. <laughs> Smart move. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, also with me is Justin. Uh, same, same question to you. I'll do the 2060s. That way I can see what's coming. Oh. Was that an option? Not really, but uh, it was yeah, a it surprise like a cheat, answer. But yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> it works. <laughs> did, we, did you say time travel to the past or just time travel? I wasn't I don't know listening. That I, I don't know what I said. but Yeah, who cares? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's still my answer. 2060s it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that might be dangerous, and who knows? Anyway. And if this is your first time listening, normally we like to start off every episode in a section called News on the March, where we talk about film and TV news, or just usually the TV and movies that we have been watching. Then we move into our feature review this week. As I said at the top of the show, we are reviewing Last Night in Soho. That's right. And here on the Casual Cinecast, every other week, or just about every other week, we put out a Casually Criterion episode. In these episodes, listeners choose a film from the Criterion Collection for us to review by voting in a poll that we put out on our Twitter account. So look forward to our next Criterion poll. Also check out our last Criterion episode on on, uh, The Night of the Hunter and also a ton of other Criterion Collection reviews. And um, yeah, what our next one is Bull Durham, right? Yeah. 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 That's delayed because a bunch of interesting movies to talk about are coming out theatrically and... I guess yeah. we all feel like celebrating that. It's almost like a year and a half worth of interesting movies decided to all start to be <laughs> dumped in theaters at one time. Yeah. yeah. So like a backlog or something. Yeah. It's like something yeah. happened. Yeah. In the yeah. world. Hmm. But who knows what? Yeah. yeah. Maybe we can we'll time never travel know, really. a year back and find yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, if you want to vote in our next Criterion poll or ask us questions about the movies you're reviewing, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Casual Cinecast. The poll will specifically be on the Twitter account, so that's the best place to follow us. You can also email us at casualcinemedia at gmail.com. And then, of course, if you haven't done so already, you want to help us grow the show, help other people find it, leave us a review on iTunes, on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on, and uh, that'll make us feel good. Thank you. Okay, and with that, I think it's time to go ahead and just get into News on the March. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, here we go. News on the March. Okay, Justin. What have you been doing this week? What have you been watching? Well, still watching The Foundation, as we've talked about before, but since that's not over, we're not talking about that yet. Uh, I did want to talk about, in the spirit of Last Night in Soho and Edgar Wright, his documentary on the band Sparks that came out, I I think, in in the middle of COVID and uh, maybe towards the tail end of it, um, like much earlier in 2021. But uh, it's finally available on Netflix, at least here in the U.S. it is. I don't know about other places. Uh, but I saw that it was out on Netflix, and I've been interested in it just because the the word of mouth about it was so good. You know, there were a lot of people saying, you know, I've never even heard of Sparks before, but Edgar Wright's made such a good film that, I, you know, it's, it's worth checking out. This is a, a great documentary. And I am in that very same boat. I had never heard of Sparks before. Uh, but the film is called uh, The Sparks Brothers, and I have to say I was really thoroughly entertained. I think Edgar Wright has a lot of fun with the interviews and with the, the documentary format. He, there's some animation and other things, and I, and I think the band, too, just kind of has a fascinating story of this band that was almost popular, and then they would reinvent themselves and kind of like fall out of the limelight again. And then 
do reinvent themselves again and then get a little more popular. And it's this roller coaster ride of, of this band's journey that they started, uh, I, I believe, in like in the late 70s or early 80s. And they're still a band. They're still making music. They've put out like 20 something albums worth of music. And I find a band like that who's maintained and done that for so long while also being a band I've never heard of. It, I find that really interesting and to, to see, you know, what people at the time thought about them and what their thoughts are on their career and all that stuff is, is really fascinating. And it's just, they're a weird quirky band that is oftentimes funny in their uh, eccentricity, you know, like kind of in the way that, you know, David Byrne and talking heads is a little eccentric and weird at times. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's kind of the vibe I got from them. Um, also a side note, they did all of the music in a net, that's true. That uh, film people might know. Uh, that movie starring Adam Driver and Marion Cotillard and uh, the dude from Big Bang Theory. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Howard from Big Bang Theory. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they did that. And there's actually a lot of stuff for film people in here, which I don't know if that's how Edgar Wright got involved with them being such like, a film nerd. But they were working together um, with Jacques Tati go- going to do a film that kind of fell apart. And I think Tim Burton as well was going to do a film mm-hmm. with them where they wrote music. And there's definitely some, some overlap in like film history, some where, where it goes into that, that um, as like a film person, I found those parts particularly interesting. It would be interesting to see a Tim Burton film. Uh, I'm trying to figure out where Tim Burton went off the rails for me. Um, <laughs> like pre Charlie the Chocolate Factory, maybe it would have been interesting to see him do something with them. Yeah, I think so too. I did. I think this was in the nineties. Yeah. So in, that's in his peak Tim Burton time. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's a lot in- interesting there, even if you're not like a big music person. Uh, but if you are a music person at all, if you're into music, if you're into like talking heads or, you know, like new wave eighties stuff, cause they're, it's kind of the wheelhouse that they're in. I would that's definitely, that's what, uh, I, that's the vibe I got, uh, watching Annette is very talking heads esque. It seems yeah, like a good double feature with Annette, you know, watch the Sparks brothers documentary after you watch Annette, you know, like in the same night, it seems yeah. The Probably way so. to go. You should definitely just watch Annette anyways, just because it is a it is a it is a movie, all right. <laughs> yeah, and and I think it's just fun to see Edgar Wright, you know, do the things that he does in his films, like have fun with the the format and mm-hmm. references and be a little playful with editing and and other stuff and see him do that in a documentary format. It makes it really entertaining. I think even if you're, you know, not inherently interested in the subject matter, I think the film is entertaining enough and uh, I I would love to see him do more documentaries. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I haven't seen the movie, but I agree that the Edgar Wright doing a documentary aspect of this all has me more interested than sparks themselves do, because like you said, I don't know a whole lot about them other than, what I heard on Annette. <laughs> yeah. Well, watch this and learn about them. That's pretty much all I have to say about it is just recommending this, especially if you're an Edgar Wright fan or like a music person at all. Uh, so, and it, and it fits in. If I'm ever going to talk about this movie on um, the last night in Soho review episode is the place to do it. <laughs> or the next <laughs> Edgar Wright film. Yeah. But that would be <laughs> even weirder. Cause it's like probably be a couple years removed. Right. Yeah, Probably. Yeah. But anyways, that's enough about the Sparks Brothers. Mike, what are you watching? Yeah, so this week, uh, I actually went to a theater on the weekend, which is something that I've been avoiding since this whole uh, going back to the movie theater thing has started. But Mm -hmm. the word of mouth and the reviews had me so curious about this film that I, I decided to go on on a Saturday night. Wow. And uh, I'm talking about The Eternals, which is, I think, notoriously at this point, the first rotten, is in Rotten Tomatoes, the first rotten uh, MCU film. 
and oh, wow. I, I didn't know it maintained that status. That's interesting. Yeah, I knew it well, dipped there. I, yeah, yeah. It it was up and down for a while, but I think it's pretty much settled at this point as as a rotten MCU film. And that intrigued me because even though it's rotten, if you look at the content of the reviews, they seem more divisive than negative. And with the MCU, you don't, you don't usually get divisive, right? You usually get, it's okay. It's, it's okay to good is I think generally, generally the range of the MCU. You very rarely get something that divides people. And so that intrigued me. Plus, I am a big Chloe Zhao fan. I love the writer, and I think Nomadland is really good. And this is obviously uh, her first, you know, foray into big blockbuster filmmaking. And I gotta say, I don't understand the <laughs> the negativity towards this movie. Not to say that it's perfect, but... It is vastly more interesting than about half of the MCU. Easily. Mm. Right? Like, I think I, I, I have a, an ongoing list where I rank the MCU because oh, a couple of years back, I think we all ranked the MCU on this show. And so I've been kind of keeping up with it ever since. And as I'm looking at the list now, out of however many movies and TV shows so far, I have Eternals ranked at twelve. Oh, Which wow. I including think, TV yeah. shows, you said? Yeah, I'm, I'm including TV shows in that. So it's it's easily in the upper half of the MCU, in my opinion. And and I think the reason this movie is getting so much uh, controversy around it, I, I mean, you know, whatever you want to call it, I think it's because they do a lot of things differently in this one. And I feel like people have a knee-jerk reaction to be like, it's different. And I don't think different necessarily means worse. You know what I mean? Like, this is miles better than most of the Iron Man movies, except for the first one. I think all the Thor movies, except for debatably Ragnarok. Unless you're mm -hmm. Justin. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the uh, way, he hates Ragnarok, so just... Yeah, that's that's what I mean by that. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I just think it's it's interesting. And what Chloe Zhao does is... Well, first of all, the cinematography is beautiful, right? Like, it's not all filmed on a bunch of green screen. Like, they go all over the place, and they're really in forests, and they're really in deserts, and they're really in jungles, and wind is blowing their hair, and sun is in their eyes. And, you know, the the green screen has gotten pretty good in these Marvel movies. Like, you can't really tell, generally, whenever they're not, like, in a real house or whatever, mm -hmm. or where they're not really outside, but man you can definitely tell when they are, if that makes sense, right? Like, yeah, you can tell. Like, it just has a grittiness to it that is just more interesting to look at. They, they, this movie's not perfect. It has a lot, it has a lot of the problems the MCU does, right? Like, I think they interject humor whenever it's not needed or particularly wanted, uh, which is, I think, a sin that every MCU movie <laughs> has, yeah, but the questions they wrestle with, especially in the third act of the movie, are more akin to something like Watchmen than they are like Captain America, if that makes sense. So I don't know. I, I find it really interesting. And if you are a person who has been turned off by the initial critical reception, I say give it a shot because I think, like I said before, interesting and divisive is always better than blandly accepted in my opinion <laughs> yeah I don't know. do you guys have any opinion on this movie or know anything about it or have any thoughts about it i haven't seen it yet um i like what you're saying i like i like what i'm hearing from you uh and it wasn't because of the i, I don't know why i haven't seen it I, I guess i was busy this weekend but let me let me real quick ask you guys what is your temperature on the mcu right now i know we kind of fluctuate as time goes on now that we've had the tv shows just in general how are you guys feeling about the MCU? Like, you feeling good about it? Or are you tired of it? I'm not as into it as I was leading up to something like Infinity War. Yeah. But I'm still on board so far. Um, 
I don't know. You know, it's like a, it's a, it's an ongoing story, and I've invested this much time, so I'll probably <laughs> keep watching until I just can't stand what I'm seeing. But things like Loki and WandaVision and the upcoming Doctor Strange movie have me intrigued, at least, at, that they are doing some interesting stuff. Yeah. How about you, Justin? You've always kind of been the uh, the naysayer to the MCU. Are you still feeling the same way, or uh, wh- where are you well, at right now? You know, doing the podcast, we we started watching, you know, all of the movies for this to review it, and, and we've been watching the shows, you know, and that kind of got me into it, you know, just being along for the ride and, you know, in with everybody. So, uh, you know, I still have that level of interest in what's to come, you know, and I, I will say that it's waned a little bit since end game, you know, yeah, I think yeah. it's hard to feel as excited as that. So I definitely would say I'm cooler, you know, and we've had and, like, Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, and the, the TV shows have, the TV shows have done something different. Like I'm more excited for Marvel TV shows right now than I am with the films, just because I still, I still feel that like coming down from like the, the end of the journey that Endgame and infinity war was right. Yeah. We're in the build up phase again, I guess. Yeah. So, so I'm definitely cooler and I would be like, I'm more excited for Loki season two than anything else. <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> in regards uh, well, to Eternals specifically, if we're ready to move back into that. Sure. Yeah. So I think the trailer for this film is what made me not really, you know, go out and see it, you know, the first weekend or, or yet to this point, because I thought the trailer for the film, it didn't make it look very good. <laughs> I, I was like, oh, this looks kind of, eh, you know. And if anything, this division of like people saying it's good or it's bad or whatever, like that's made that has made me more interested in it just because that is generally not the Marvel thing. Like usually it's at least like, yes, it's good or it's great. And they range from there, you know? Yeah. 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 And I would say I agree. The trailers didn't necessarily sell me on it either. Um, mainly because, I don't know, I thought some of the humor didn't land, and that's ultimately what didn't land in the movie for me. But there are some big swings that Marvel took. Like, for example, usually their movies are squeaky clean. You know, there's no um, sexual content, and there is no homosexual content. And this movie has both of those things. And Disney has, I don't know about, I don't, I'm sure Disney would prefer to get cut, but, but Kevin Feige and Marvel have stood by that content and refused to cut it out and therefore sacrificing their release in China. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, And so star Wars kind of had like, uh, like a same sex kiss, but they weren't even characters. And they like kind of paraded that around as like, Oh, we were friendly with this thing. You know, like, is it the same thing here? Are these actual characters that are, they're actual characters. Cause like the, I don't think star Wars necessarily printed it around so much as they were like, they were forced by fans to be like, why aren't you including this stuff? And they're like, okay, we did. Don't worry. (laughs) Whereas like Marvel is like, yeah, these are our, one of our main characters, right? Like this is a, a character in the movie with speaking parts and, uh, an arc and, you know, yeah, like it's, it's definitely like a plot point in the movie. So I think that's to be commended. Uh, yeah, and I don't know. I, I'm sure, like I said, Disney probably has nothing to do with this. I'm sure they would prefer it be out of there. But that's two movies recently that the MC, the last two movies, the MCU has sacrificed their release in China for standing <laughs> by their uh, their casting and their and their choices and their decisions. So I don't know. I hope that's a, a sign of things to come. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I would yeah. think so. You know, there's I think no it's, reason it's that getting Marvel to the point isn't... now where I don't think you can possibly uh, <laughs> bow to China, China's box office and their censors, and also make American audiences happy. So, 
Yeah, it's it's interesting that I think they've kind of reached that point now. Yeah, absolutely interesting. Okay, uh, I think that's all I really have to say about Eternals, unless you guys had any questions. No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't really want to know too much about it. You know, I just kind I kind of yeah. want to go in. You know, I know it's Chloe Zhao. I know it's Marvel, and that's and I've seen like the trailer, but that's all I really want to know. Yeah, I'm that's excited. all you need to know. Well, there we go. You could even know less, and you'd probably be okay. Yeah, I know. I shouldn't have watched the trailer. I might have seen it by now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's move on. And this is this next topic is was going to be a full review, but then at the last minute, we wanted to talk about other things too. So here we go. Uh, Wes Anderson's The French Dispatch. Who yes. wants to kick us off? Chris, you haven't. Yeah, yeah. Talked uh, to any, uh, initially about anything yet (laughs) right so i I always get excited about uh, a new wes anderson film um because i always find them somewhat intriguing like his uh style of like every detail uh like is presided over and you know like if there's ever like an auteur theory that applies to anybody i think wes anderson uh it, it applies to wes anderson sometimes like, because I think everything that's in that frame, Wes Anderson, you know, like does, you know, and fixes and it, it doesn't go against, there's nothing in his frames by accident is what I should say. Uh, and I do find that interesting. Um, he, he's often like, oftentimes though, with his movies, uh, the second time I watch the film is when I find it a lot more interesting. And I'm not sure why that is. Maybe it's because uh, I'm not on the level of Wes Anderson. Because I, I usually always end up loving all of his films. It just takes me twice, you know? <laughs> yeah. uh, and sure. I haven't seen The French Dispatch twice. I've seen it just the once uh, now. And I, I did enjoy it. Um, uh, yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at. I, I feel like... It, I like all those things and I want to hear what you guys have to say. And before we're out, I want to hear uh, you guys' favorite segment. Um, so we'll, we'll vote first. Let's talk about the movie. Okay. Justin. Me? Next? Okay. <laughs> yeah, go. Cool. <laughs> so I like this movie a lot. I thought it was really fun. I thought it was really entertaining. For those who don't know, this is an anthology film. So it's made up of several separate segments and stories as opposed to one overarching narrative. Uh, At least in a way, the overarching narrative is pretty small. It's just kind of the device that ties all these stories together. And the thing that I guess would keep me back from saying like, I really love this movie is just the nature of anthology films. And is that you, you have several different segments and you have your attachment to it and enjoyment or ride through those segments. And then you move on to another one and you reset and you, you kind of start again. And um, for the most part, I find that to be less satisfying than a single overarching story um, throughout like an entire movie. Yeah. That said, I, I think French dispatch might be my favorite anthology film because I did find uh, an emotional connection and an emotional resonance from the thing that ties all the stories together, which uh, is not a spoiler because this is set up in the very early part of the movie, but this is the, you're basically seeing all the stories and pieces uh, from the last issue of a magazine after the creator of the magazine dies. And and he decrees that all of the presses shall be smelt and (laughs) melted down and the production will cease on the magazine upon his death. Right. So mm-hmm. you're you're seeing the last episode, which our last issue of the magazine, and to me, I kind of enjoyed that, and it gave a little bit more weight to what connected everything to the the moments in between when we saw him talking to the writers about the stories and giving them his you know editorial expertise or advice on them or whatever. Uh, so I I enjoyed that, but I think the with anthologies there are segments that are better than others. And oftentimes when you hit a segment that's not as good as other ones, 
it feels like a big lull in the film. Like all of a sudden the film just kind of grinds to a halt for however long that segment is. And I think you have weaker segments in this film (laughs) and better segments. So it's not a consistent ride. And um, yeah, that's just the nature of it. But I I was pretty much entertained the whole way through though. Like I, I did, I was entertained. I don't know that I got much more out of it than just being entertained and laughing several times and just enjoying it overall. And uh, that's where I'm in at. So, Mike, what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, well summed up, Justin. Uh, I would say <laughs> you're right. This is different than a lot of anthologies in the sense that it does have an overarching narrative, a beginning, little intermissions, and then uh, like an end where it ties all three stories together in a way that makes sense. Um, I don't know that personally for myself – it's as successful as it is for you. Like I preferred the Coen brothers anthology that came out like a couple of years ago, like the ballad of Buster Scruggs, which were less loosely tied together and more just like changing genres between each one of them while all maintaining a, a theme. But it is interesting to see Wes Anderson do something like this. He's able to basically make four movies in one. And that's pretty cool. I would say this is Wes Anderson at the height of his like visual uh, capabilities, right? Like this is visually probably the most entertaining and interesting and kinetic Wes Anderson movie. He does a lot of really interesting things. And I think this is him at the height of those powers while simultaneously being the least emotionally engaging one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think this is probably my least favorite Wes Anderson film. Uh, I don't dislike it. It's still a good movie. You know, I'm yeah. like on Letterboxd, I'm sitting at a three out of five. But I don't know. It It certainly felt emotionally distant from me. I wasn't able to access it. And usually West Anderson style is a little emotionally distant, but heartwarming at the same time or sweet or something. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I would say this is Wes Anderson. It is m- most horny. <laughs> sure. <laughs> if, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I was going to say playful, but horny is a word too. Well, I mean, it has the most sexual content of any Wes Anderson film. Yeah. And the most I, nudity, for sure. Yeah, I was going to say I'm pretty sure the most nudity. The only other nudity I can think of in a Wes Anderson movie is Life Aquatic, but I could be wrong. There's like a three-second shot in the Royal Tenenbaums. Okay. Well, there's more than but, that um, in Life Aquatic, and there's more in this than Life Aquatic, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say my favorite segment is the f- uh, is the first one. Uh, there's a segment with Benicio Del Toro and Leah Sadu. Oh, yeah. I thought you were going to say that. I thought you meant the Owen Wilson one, like his little travelogue sort of. Oh, uh, no. Well, that's thing. like the <laughs> intro thing. I don't know. Yeah, I guess that's part of his technically a segment. But that one was that one was good, too. It, it got the most laughs in the theater was yeah. Owen Wilson's little segment at the beginning with the children like, who were half drunk on the blood of Christ. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or on yeah. we rises early on a Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, but cool. yeah, I, I, that's kind of where I'm at. I will say the very, very beginning of this film in the little intro, it starts out with a shot that just straight up seems like someone parodying, parod, parodying Wes Anderson. There's a shot with like a food tray being meticulously placed. Oh, yeah. And a, and a waiter going upstairs. Mm-hmm. I actively dislike that part. I was thinking, oh, no, I think Wes Anderson's charm is completely lost on me now. <laughs> No, because it, it, it just comes right. on too strong, man, and too too meticulous. I don't know. But ultimately, I, I came around on the rest of the movie and, and had its ups and downs. But I did not think I was going to like it based on the first, like, three or four minutes of the movie. Yeah. Well, that opening shot, well, I guess it's not the opening shot, but the, the shot of the waiter going through the house was, um, the, was that Mon Uncle? Mon Uncle? The Tati. Tati. Yeah. Yeah, it had Tati it had Tati it. vibes. I don't remember what movie it was from, but I thought I think of Tati. Wes Anderson's done that before too, so Yeah, probably I know he's done that like 
you see like uh, like a building as though like this one side has been cut off and you see everything you know yeah yeah he's been doing that for a while yeah he's he's been done that plenty um but i think that one specifically just like kind of the single wide shot <laughs> of yeah. it uh i think was was influenced by uh tati and mononcle um so that was kind of fun for me but i, I do think it took me a little bit to dive back in because so much of it as he you know i guess gets more and more creative freedom because people love what he does and maybe bigger and bigger budgets he he does seem to be like a parody of himself at times as he goes more and more yeah he kind of i don't want to say that he does the same thing kind of over and over again he has the same style over and over again and he hits kind of the same notes yeah you know uh like you like mike was saying like there's like a, a shot of you know meticulously preparing something in all of his movies i imagine except for maybe bottle rocket or rushmore like his early stuff but there's always like you know th- th- he's got this cutesy style and I, I i legitimately you know if somebody doesn't like that style you know <laughs> you're not you know like you you're not going to like wes anderson and that's that's you, any of his movies you might like some of his early stuff because it's not quite there yet but and i i can understand you know if you don't like his style you know yeah. what was yeah. your favorite? i would like him to go back to the early days of maybe a little less of that yeah i i would always just, like to just see to change him. things up a bit not because i think it's i mean, I just think it's getting a little played out you know yeah it's kind of like the mcu <laughs> you yeah. know like maybe you're doing the same thing too much uh, i it's not that i don't enjoy it but like i'd like to see you or you could even do the same style, but do it in like a different genre or something. Do it with I, new I, energy. Yes, I don't know. I I like him, and I I, I don't. I'm not going to turn away one of his West, his films, but uh, yeah. Well, I think it's interesting because like the biggest laughs, or at least the most consistent times that people were laughing, was when something quirky would happen visually, like Wes Anderson quirky would happen visually. You know at least in that was my theatrical experience was I would hear people chuckle out loud whenever the camera would do something very obviously Wes Anderson or when we'd switch to animation, you know, Mm -hmm. something like that. And it was almost like, almost like those things are the jokes themselves now, (laughs) you know? Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Whereas, you know, there would be an actual joke that would happen like in a line delivery or, or, you know, some, some funny bit. And I would laugh out loud and then the rest of the theater was silent. I'd kind of feel like a dummy for a second. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, there, so many parody yeah. videos of uh, him online, like the X Men parody video, and like Wes Anderson does horror movies, you know, yeah. parody type stuff. So yeah, maybe that is yeah. part of the thing. Is like his style is a joke to a certain extent. Yeah. Uh, but what what I will agree with Mike on though is the characters i think what this film is missing is a character to latch on to to care about to find interesting because so many of these characters oftentimes just feel like wes anderson characters as opposed <laughs> to having any depth and that's part of the nature of the anthology again as we're in and we're out with these characters and i think i missed getting attached to any one person because i don't think this film has that and that's goes to what I was saying about how I was thoroughly entertained by the movie for sure, yeah. but it's missing something to make it great. And then I think what it's missing is that emotional like resonance. Maybe yeah. that Benicio del Toro's character is the one that comes closest. I think what do you guys maybe think? closest to maybe having like, something more than just a Wes Anderson character, you know, like, yeah, I think for me, maybe the most complicated one that I enjoyed was Leah Seydoux's character. Yeah. I, I found her to be really interesting because she was just... Like, what what was she going through her mind? You know, I want to know what she was thinking about. I wanted more from her. And so, like, in a, that sense, I found her more interesting, you know? And yeah. that was my favorite segment, too, by the way. Okay. And I think it... What about you, I'd be Chris? surprised if anybody said anything different. What did you? What do you think, Chris? Uh, well, I, while I really like that segment, I I think the one I'm going to go with is the maybe it was because it was the last one, uh, but the dinner uh, sequence I liked all the goofy action and 
uh, the making of the dinner and stuff like that. I, I enjoyed was it that. The kidnapping one? Oh, yeah, the kidnapping well, one. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I uh, like seeing Jeffrey Wright favorite. in a Wes Anderson movie. Yeah, that was kind of... I thought Jeffrey Wright was really good. I, I don't think he had like as as much of a character necessarily as like Benicio Del Toro, but I thought Jeffrey Wright like really did a really great job of like delivering those lines in a way that uh, gave it more than just you know, delivering those lines, right? I mm-hmm. like listening to him talk. Yeah, that's and that's the perfect segment for you then. Yeah, <laughs> I think the stories kind of progressively went downhill for me. Yeah, but, I probably agree yeah. with that too. You know, Absolutely so th- th- that's what I was saying to you about just like at a certain point, the film kind of lulls when one uh, one segment isn't as good as another, and it you can kind of or it, that sticks out more, you know, in this type of film. Yeah, agreed. Okay, so do we have anything else we want to say about the French Dispatch? Nope. No, I still think it's worthwhile. Oh worth yeah, seeing. for sure. Yeah, definitely. Even though I like it the least, probably, and it's my least favorite Wes Anderson film, that doesn't mean you shouldn't watch it. Yeah. It's, it's still not better my than least most favorite. films. It's it's probably third from the bottom, maybe for me. Uh, like I I vastly prefer this to Isle of Dogs, and I think this might be just a little bit more just overall fun and enjoyable than Darjeeling, but uh, it's pretty close. It's been so long since yeah. I've seen Darjeeling. I need to watch. Yeah, that I could reevaluate. Should I see some of the like Darjeeling or Isle of Dogs again? But as of now, I remember leaving the theater. Uh, feeling that like I was comfortable with my my proclamation of it being my least favorite. Okay, real quick take. Sorry, uh, but I, what I would like to see this is this is the answer to the Wes Anderson problem. Owen Wilson write a script with Wes Anderson again because all the early ones were like Owen Wilson contributed to those, and I think Owen Wilson kind of brought some of. I think he brought something different to those characters that uh, we see in those early. Uh, movies like Royal Tenenbaums and uh, Rushmore and even Bottle yeah. Rocket. Uh, I, I, because I, I do think that those may be his best movies. Maybe? I think Royal Tenenbaums is still my favorite. And I think yeah. that's because I have a theory and it's because Gene Hackman isn't a Wes Anderson type. He's like an old school, gruff Hollywood type and brings a certain energy that no other Wes Anderson film has, except for maybe Bottle Rocket with James Conn. Yeah, yeah, James Conn. I, I think both of those <laughs> actors didn't know what they were doing in those films. Right. I, mean, I think we need. Good. I think we need Wes Anderson to break out of his comfort zone with an actor that doesn't quite doesn't get like it. Him. <laughs> yeah, um, and Owen Wilson. Bring Owen Wilson back to write. That's what I say. Yeah, I think he did well with Noah Baumbach too, when he did Life Aquatic and Fantastic Mr. Fox were were co written. Fantastic Mr. Fox is really good. I need to watch uh, Life Aquatic again as well. Yeah, I'm a big Life Aquatic fan. Yeah, who's the 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 guy that's in um, Brian Cox? That's his name in Rushmore. He's kind of the the gruff old man, the the guy that doesn't fit. <laughs> in, yeah, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. So I think Wes Anderson is at his strongest when he has an old man that doesn't quite fit, <laughs> that doesn't get it. Yeah, <laughs> not not in on the joke. <laughs> All, right. All right. Cool. So, uh, main review time. Let's do it. Yep. I could live any place in any time I'd live here. In London. In the 60s. Last night, I saw something in my dreams. was a girl. And you are? Sandy. Okay, so as always with our new films, we will be doing a spoiler-free section up front. We'll be talking generally about our thoughts on Last Night in Soho, so you can listen to that and decide if you want to go see the movie. Before we get into spoilers, we'll let you know. We'll give you a warning. We'll play a little bumper so you have plenty of time to pause the podcast, go watch Last Night in Soho, and come back and finish listening to all the spoilery stuff. That's right. So, Last Night in Soho was directed by Edgar Wright. It stars Thomasin McKenzie, Anya Taylor-Joy, Matt Smith, 
and I'm going to go ahead and add here Diana Rigg. Okay. The IMDb synopsis says, An aspiring fashion designer is mysteriously able to enter the 1960s when she encounters a dazzle, or where she encounters a dazzling wannabe singer, but the glamour is not all it appears to be, and her dreams of the past start to crack and splinter into something darker. Whew. You need to catch your breath? Yeah. Whew. <laughs> um, little long, but accurate, I suppose. Yeah. I like the first sentence. That's enough for me. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, okay, oh well. who wants to kick us off on this film? Um, I can do that if you want, because I think this was on my most anticipated films of 2020, I think it was, when this was supposed to <laughs> yeah, I believe so. originally come out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that was back when the, uh, there wasn't even a tagline for the movie. <laughs> it was just Edgar was Wright's just new Edgar film. Wright. Yeah, yeah, starring Anya Taylor-Joy and Thomas and McKenzie. And I said, yeah. No, I mean, I'm there. That's all I need I'm to know. Yeah, I'm anticipating this greatly. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, so I went and saw this movie. This was actually my first um, time to go back to the theater on like a busy weekend or what I thought would be a busy weekend. It wasn't actually that packed at the end of the day. But yeah, I went on Halloween. Yeah, I went on a Friday night at like prime, like 7 p.m. is showing th- uh, showtime, you know. So I saw it on a Tuesday. Nice. Um, but anyways, the, that's probably neither here nor there, but just wanted to say that, you know, went on a weekend and it wasn't as packed as I thought it was going to be. I don't know if that says anything about the performance of this film or just theaters in general. Theaters in general. But whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so Edgar Wright, I'm a big fan of his um, Hot Fuzz, I think is just like a 10 out of 10 amazing movie. I pretty much feel the same way about Shaun of the Dead, even though I think it's a little bit lesser, uh, lesser realized. Um since then, I th- I've been kind of hit or miss on his films. I haven't loved any film uh, of his um, completely since those two movies. This is probably the closest I've been to loving any one of his films. I think this is his best film since Hot Fuzz. I thought it was a lot of fun. I think visually there's a lot of really fun stuff he's doing with uh, reflections. I think there's a love that he has for the genre that this film is is tapping into, which is that sort of 1960s, 1970s, uh, Italian horror film, or even Giallo, Giallo. Yes. Or even other films that were then influenced by those films, you know, uh, Roman Polanski type horror films. You know, I think there's a lot of, um, repulsion and Rosemary's baby in this film too. And I, I think you feel the love for that genre and how much, he knows how that genre works and he makes it work here. Uh, But in a way that doesn't feel like it's being a a parody or like just a straight up like rehash of that. It feels modern. It feels, it doesn't feel dated necessarily. And I just think the movie is a lot of fun. I, I think that, I think that repeat viewings of this will probably give you more to catch, more to admire from a filmmaking perspective and from the way that this film and story are constructed. But I do wonder if this film is at its best on like the first time you see it. And afterwards it might be a little bit harder to get the same enjoyment out of it because man, there is some mystery to this film. There is some, you know, what's going on nest to it. And yeah, I'm just wondering if that if that kind of hurts the film a little bit, but it hurts the film in in, ter- in the long run is what I'm saying. Uh, outside of that, um, I I think Thomas and McKenzie is incredible in this. Anya Taylor Joy is really great. Matt Smith, who uh, I'm familiar with from being in Doctor Who, but I've never seen Doctor Who, so <laughs> I assume he's more likable in that than he is in this. So this feels like a role I wasn't <laughs> yes, he expecting. Is. He's basically <laughs> playing the same character as he did in yeah. Doctor Who. Oh wow. <laughs> Wait, you're joking, right? Yeah, he okay. is. Okay. <laughs> so this felt like a different turn from him, something a little unexpected, uh, a role that you don't see him in. And I thought he did really well in it. And uh, yeah, entertaining movie. Can't really say much more, so I'll leave it there. Um, Mike, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so like you, I am a Edgar Wright fan going way back. Uh, I wasn't quite there for... 
spaced. I caught up to that after the the hit that was Shaun of the Dead that came out when I was in high school. Watched all of his movies since then in theaters. I've never disliked any of them. I think he's always a great director, even if the script isn't as good as him. Uh, I'm looking at you, Scott Pilgrim. <laughs> um, uh, even Baby Driver, I thought he was like a fantastic like action director, car chase director, and all that stuff. Um, I was a little let down by the script on that one. Not because it was bad, because it was just a little straightforward. But uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I think I agree with you on this one. This is his best film since Hot Fuzz. I don't know that it's as good as Hot Fuzz, but I, don't think I so. really enjoyed it. it. It's not really trying to be that scary. It's more um, a love letter to things that he likes. You know, old music, giallo, <laughs> horror films, and Roman Polanski films, right? Um, I think there is sort of an underlying message in this movie, which I think gives it a little bit more strength, like something that Baby Driver didn't necessarily have. And I think that is, uh, you know, we have a ten- tendency nowadays to romanticize old things in the past and think that they were better then. Uh, and maybe that's not always true, you know? I don't know. But the performances are all really great here. Technically speaking, he remains just a very... Very good visual director, a lot of energy. He can he can like convey in editing and camera movements. Um, yeah, I will say that there are some twists and turns that I wish were a little more mysterious because I did catch on to certain elements of things. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, that didn't stop me from having fun. Uh, I think the first two acts were a little stronger than the third act, but. I also still enjoyed that for what it is. You know, it's it's just sort of this schlocky, goofy, fun ghost story, you know? And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I'll keep it there, but uh, I enjoyed it. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, uh, I, I'm kind of right there with you guys. Um, I think I may have a little bit more problems with the third act and the turn there. And there's, like, one character... Uh, that's actually normally reserved for like the girlfriend, uh, except for in this case, it's the boyfriend where there's not much of a character and things seem a little weird and wonky. And we'll talk, we can talk more about that in spoilers, uh, if we want to. Yeah. Um, and and so the third act for me kind of didn't live up to the first two acts that, and it kind of let me down just a bit, you know, uh, I thought the, you know, the, time travel stuff the dream sequences are amazing um uh i the three main characters matt smith anya taylor joy and thomas and mckenzie are all really great uh and I, I like seeing diana riggs and uh is it diana riggs or diane riggs rig rig no s um i, I thought Two she G's was and no s <laughs> related to uh the guy mel gibson's character from lethal weapon um <laughs> <laughs> That's anyways rigged. and terrence stamp i like seeing terrence stamp in that as well uh yeah. yeah i i i really enjoyed this movie i think we can dive more into it and cover stuff that we haven't really talked about um in spoilers uh but i i, I highly recommend it um i, I actually you had, what do you guys think about um what was the third cornetto trilogy movie uh the end of the world the world's, world's end. end. The world's end. Yeah, I actually really like that one. Uh, everybody really hates that, uh, but I I don't I hate it. I've just bit. only seen it once. Yeah, I think it's a bad movie. I've seen it like three times, and I can't ever get on board with it. I, I think it's just a bad. bad. Friend, no. I think <laughs> I I think the word bad is too harsh, and I don't know. But that's just I me. don't. I've tried. You've only seen it once. <laughs> I've sat through that movie three times. <laughs> Why did you sit through it three times? Because I want to like it, and I like the other two <laughs> Cornetto movies so much, I keep giving it another chance every few years, and oh, I see, and it's okay. it's it just never sticks. And while you know, visually he's great as we've talked about, and I think as a director and the things that he's doing on screen and the fun that he's having there uh, work, like the action is good. Like that movie, I think the script and characters are just all wrong and uninteresting and terrible. Okay, but <laughs> sorry, you know, I didn't mean to bring us into that one. No, uh, it's okay. 
You asked. The other thing I, I did want to point out, too, is I, I find it interesting. Someone, and I can't take credit for this. Someone pointed this out uh, to me, a friend. But, like, uh, I wonder, it, it would have been really interesting if these had a, if it had to come out last year. Because then it would have been a little bit more in conversation with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which is all nostalgia. And now, you know, Quentin Tarantino does his own thing with that one, too. But it's all about, like, man, it would have been great to make movies back, back here. You know, like... Uh, these two movies together like kind of are talking to each other like wait a second maybe nostalgia is not that great you know so I, I do find that interesting yeah i think that this movie yeah it, it feels totally different to me like this movie's certainly a love letter to the time but i i feel like it's more a love letter to the films and the pop culture to come out of that time than the time itself. Whereas I feel like once upon a time in Hollywood, it's a bit more about being there in that time is what it's kind of longing for and, and shining love on. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I, there is something, there's a scene in here, Justin, where, uh, I thought of you because I know, one thing that you really hate in movies is when someone just Googles what's going on. <laughs> yes. Did that happen in this movie? No, but they, she looks up old, uh, microfilm, like projections in a, in a library. And I wondered if they had oh, yeah. the same effect on you of being annoying. No, 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 not at all. Because I, I think when it, when it really bugs me in a film is when they Google it. And like one of the first, like two results they click on is like what they're looking for. You know, yeah, yeah. Like, like this happens. I think in in the Ring, the American version. I would know. It happens lost. in that Lindsay Lohan movie where she's like a twin or something. Yeah, I know who killed me. The yeah. Paul Schrader film. Uh, is maybe that is that Schrader? Paul Schrader? Yeah. Oh wow, uh, weird. Yeah, that guy's had some ups and downs. Yeah, <laughs> he sure has. Yeah. Uh, well, they 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 their like search term is just like weirdly just right on the money and then they nail it and get the result they're looking for like almost immediately, which is not my experience with Google, but, <laughs> uh, but anyways, yeah, no, no, no. Someone going to a library and looking through, you know, newspapers of like a certain year trying to find stories specifically they're looking for, like that's work, that's effort. There's, that's true. there's some editing going on to, to convey that there's time spent doing it. And so this yeah, did not okay. bother me. All right, now we've defined your line. I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, um, oh, crap, I had something, and now now it has slipped my mind. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, I can step in real quick here. <laughs> I know what it is, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, Thomas and McKenzie needs to be in more things. Yes, please. <laughs> yep, that's true. I think that's she's true. great here. I like the... Um, I like the like so Edgar Wright does this a lot in his comedies and we could talk more about this in spoilers but little offhanded lines usually end up meaning something or are like really on the nose or or like comically on the nose mm -hmm. this one he does it less comically so but a lot of lines at the very beginning of the movie all tie in with like themes and and twists and turns later on and I don't know I think like like I said, the script's not perfect, and and Chris touched on some of the things that maybe we could talk about more specifically later. But I enjoyed the the tightness and the the funness, if that's a word, uh, of this little ghost story here. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's it's a fun story, and I think one of the things that actually does set this film apart in other ways from his other films is something that you kind of touched on, Mike, talking about how you know it's it's saying, you know, we look back often with n nostalgia and, um, you know, there's think about like a certain time period as being like, you know, the golden age, you know, the time to have been alive and, right. and how that can be harmful. But I, th I think there's something more that this film says about trauma and the way that like it sticks with us and we can like carry it around and how that like, you know, I don't want to get too far into it yet. We'll get into it more in spoilers, but there's a message about that. And, and I don't know that many of his films, 
I can, I look back on and pull away some sort of like deeper meaning. Usually they're just kind of really entertaining and really well put together and uh, clever and well, and funny, you know? And yeah. I think this had a little bit more to it. Like I walked away with some things to think about, some messages received. Awesome. Yep. So uh, does anyone Real have anything quick. else for non-spoilers? Yeah, real quick, I, I have to correct myself. Um, so Paul Schrader did not do I Know Who Killed Me with Lindsay Lohan. That was Chris Silverston, Silverton. And Paul Schrader's one with Lindsay Lohan was The Canyons. The Canyons, so, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. My bad. <laughs> did you guys know that this this is really a weird sidebar, but um, Mike, the movie that we shot for school is in The Canyons on the TV. Lindsay Lohan is watching it. Um, Christmas what? with the Dead. Oh, what? Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Get out of here. Did no, that movie exist just... when the Canyons came out? I did... What? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. 100% serious. Uh, at least I, I'm 99% sure it's the Canyons. Um, and and I don't know if you remember, but at a certain point, they gave like six people cameras and were like, go shoot uh-huh. stuff <laughs> yeah. with like all these zombie extras that we have around because uh, it's a zombie film. And one of the shots that I shot is like w- w- the one that's on screen when she's looking at it. And I was like blown away whenever I saw this. That's crazy. Wait, yeah. what? Your zombie film is in the canyons or not the mine, not my zombie yours? film, just one I worked on in school. Like we would shoot a feature film uh, in the summers and Mike worked on it. Um, and, and during our undergrad time, we were just like crew members you know. And so the the Christmas of the Dead, the movie you guys worked on, is in the canyons. Yeah, it's on TV. Uh, while what? like that's crazy. While Lindsay Lohan is is just <laughs> sitting there, like I'm sure it's just something like, hey, we need something cheap to put on this. Yeah, no one's gonna know if we put this in our movie. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I'll be. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, no, huh. watch the canyons. Yeah. Sorry, that's no, a, I, I did not mean for that segment to go on that long. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it has nothing to do with uh, last night. Yeah. So <laughs> it's completely removed from that, but that's <laughs> so okay. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, everybody. No worries. Okay. Are we ready for spoilers now? <laughs> Let's do yes. it. Okay. No, I guess Rosebud is just a piece in a jigsaw puzzle. The only cigarettes you got up there, I'll tell you all about it. Things are going to start happening to me now. And here we go. Um, so real quick, uh, now that we're in spoilers, um, Chris, I wanted to talk about what you were mentioning with the, the boyfriend character. Cause that is probably my biggest complaint about this movie. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, he's, <laughs> and, and like I said, it was, it's typically reserved for like the girlfriend or the girl, you know, but like, uh, the idea that he is not in horror movies. Oh uh, yeah. Well, and maybe it's moving away from that a little bit more too, but like it was, he, is just there to like support her and you know, like crazy things happen to him, but he doesn't necessarily want to talk about him. You know, like he just, uh, he's like that crazy thing. We almost got killed last night, but, uh, Hey, what are you doing tonight? <laughs> you know, like, uh, it's just kind of this, he wasn't much of a character there. Um, it was, he was just there to kind of like move the plot forward in that way. You know, like he was just kind of a stand in. There wasn't much of a character. And that was kind of the problem I had with that that character. And it just fell flat to me. How about yeah, what did of, you guys think? I kind of keep trying to convince myself that he's maybe a, like a foil to Thomas and McKenzie's character or, you know, this character that is just kind of wholly, completely good, you know, without any like flaws or never really does anything wrong and is just kind of this perfect like perfect guy in a sense. And throughout the movie, you know, Thomas and McKenzie kind of slips in into this rabbit hole of becoming more and more like Anya Taylor Joy's character, a little bit harder edged and uh, maybe a little bit more promiscuous and that sort of thing. And he just kind of maintains this like straight line of being, I don't know, just kind of one note character, which is not the most entertaining, but I'm just wondering if like that's his purpose. Well, yeah, I mean, he's basically just there to 
constantly give her someone to answer the question, is she okay? So that we could progressively right. see her diminishing state of being not okay. Yeah, him reacting to her <laughs> acting crazy. Right, because she can't do that with the Diana Rigg character for obvious reasons uh, yeah. that are obvious at the end of the movie. And mm -hmm. she's hiding things from her grandma because she's scared because her grandma's seen her, her mom go through similar breakdowns in the past. So he sort of just exists to give the audience like, a, oh, not everyone's bad. Not everyone's mean to her. And it also gives her someone to to confide in so she's not just talking to herself the whole movie. <laughs> and I <laughs> yeah. agree. I wish that he were more of a character, but also I also don't want any extra subplots with this guy. I don't know. I, I maybe you just wish there was more interesting conversations between the two of them. Yeah. But yeah, you know what I mean? He's, and he's, he's almost too good in the sense that like he accepts everything that is done to him throughout the movie without much, <laughs> Uh, yeah. hesitation or self-preservation skills. I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I think the line got crossed for that um, to me whenever she almost stabs the mean girl in the face with a knife with scissors in the library and he grabs her hand and then he's just like tries to tell the girl like, Hey, it's okay. And she's like, what? No, it's not. And I was like, for once in the movie, I was finally on the mean girl side. I was like, yeah, that's not <laughs> yeah. okay. <laughs> Even the night before when, they go up to her room and then Diana Riggs shows up with a, was it like a shotgun or something like that would be something I, I feel like even the nicest guy would be like, Hey, let's talk about this. Like what happened? <laughs> you know, like, uh, yeah, you know, just kind of where it was like, uh, that was where the line was crossed for me where it's like, okay, we need to yeah. back away here for a second. Yeah. She was, she was screaming like, don't touch her. Don't touch her out of nowhere. And he's like, I'm not touching anyone. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what's, what's happening right now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that one you could almost write off to just him being more concerned about her because maybe she had trauma that he doesn't know about in her past. Yeah. But, yeah, but he... also, the next day at school, I would probably be like, listen, are you okay? I'm going to keep my distance for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, or even, yeah, I don't feel like he even talks about it. Like, I would be like, hey, are you okay? Is everything all right? Like, do we need to talk about something? Or, you know, like, I don't know. This... Yeah, did I cross a line that, made you uncomfortable yeah. somehow <laughs> yeah what's going on here <laughs> you know like uh and he's just like no i'll support you whatever i'll, I'll follow you <laughs> you know and it's just kind of yeah. a little weird and uh and those things happen and i don't want to necessarily like drag this movie down too much for that uh, I, I feel but... like his character could be remedied with like one scene at the beginning of the movie or in the middle of the movie somewhere where we just get to know a little bit more about him but something that equally doesn't slow down the pace of the movie because i feel like the pacing of the movie is pretty good yeah. 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 I, and, and it almost works because when we first see him in the movie, he's hanging out outside like the stairs of the building that she's going into. And, you know, we're kind of in that mode of, of her, you know, it's being scary. a little wary of the big city and people saying, you know, oh, the city's dangerous or whatever. And she kind of tries to talk to her and she blows him off, you know? Um, yeah. It's because so she just got done being creeped out by some creepy cab dude. <laughs> Yeah, ex exactly. Yeah. So we're like in that mode. So we're like, is this another creepy guy? You know, is he going to be like that? And so then to have him come be. And then he drinks her Coke. Good. <laughs> Who drinks an oh, open yeah. Coke? What a jerk. Actually, never mind. He is. He's a horrible person. <laughs> At the very least, he's, he's just he's he's careless. He's care. He's come what may. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna, there's an open Coke in the refrigerator with someone's name on it. I'm just going to grab it. Maybe that's why he's like the next day after like he almost gets shot by Diane Riggs. Rigg, uh, he's like, well, I did drink her Coke. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. I guess we're fair. even now. Yeah. <laughs> that was a dick move of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so going into some of the, the sixties stuff, that dance number, uh, at the, the beginning, I think it's the first time that we, we go back and we see, um, Anya Taylor joy and her talk to Matt Smith. And she's like, he's like, Sandy. Oh, can you dance? Sandy and Jack. Sandy and Jack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that dance number where we're going back and forth between uh, Sandy and Eloise as Jack is dancing with them. 
uh, yeah. is really cool. I'm convinced that they did that all practically. Uh, yeah, I've listened so, to most of it's practical. Yeah, I I heard that like there were like other sets built on the other side of mirrors and stuff too for like yeah. the entrance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that, that, you, that makes sense. They would have to like CGI and green screen it. They uh, had there was like a concierge, and I don't know where exactly this is in the movie, but uh, in an interview I heard with Edgar Wright, uh, they had twins playing the concierge. So one twin was with Anya Taylor Joy, and one was with. Uh, Taylor McKenzie, uh, Thomas and McKenzie. <laughs> and, uh, so when they switched, they look, it looked like it was the same guy. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I figured there was some twin action going on. There was some, you know, fake mirrors that were just actually like duplicate sets. Um, I figured that kind of thing was going on. I think like that dance number is so impressive because yes. it, it, the switches happen so fast between actors. And Anya Taylor joy and that, opening sequence is just like electric uh she comes in with so much confidence and she's just like nailing it like uh i mean thomas mckenzie's good in that too but just you know that's anya taylor joy joy's like role is to like everybody pays attention to her and she's so good in that uh you know like that scene that sequence yeah well she has to captivate matt smith, smith and, yeah. and the people watching and as well as thomas and mckenzie's character right yeah yeah and so then so. us as well right yeah because yeah. we have because like the first time she goes into the dream and comes out of it and then she's excited to go back into the dream world we need to be there with her you know what i mean and yeah. we are at least i was right like mm-hmm. th- the soon as she goes back into the dream world like part two i was like yes here we go and that's really i mean i think this speaks kind of to that character as well that's what the movie's interested in is doing those like dream sequences. It's not particularly interested in the modern day stuff, you know, like that it's almost like an excuse to get back to doing the crazy dream sequences, you know? Yeah. At least for the first two thirds of it, I would say that's true. You know? Yeah. Um, I will say that I did pick up on the idea and I abandoned it later whenever we see the, what we think is Anya Taylor Joy getting murdered, but I did come across. I was like, "Is Diana Riggs supposed to be Anya Taylor Joy?" They have, they both have prominent cheekbones. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's kind of what I thought really early on, and the the murder thing kind of throws you. And I think it's, I, I don't know how I feel about that. To be honest, it's almost kind of a cheat. I, yeah. I'd have to watch it again to really like to see. But yeah, it's almost like, yeah, the, it's, the movie's it's almost lying like a to me so that I can't guess. Yeah. 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 yeah it's a lie. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah and, and that's why, like, I'd have to see it again to see if it is a lie or if like maybe in the camera, I would see it differently the second time, you know? Yeah. It, I kind of rack it up to it, it is kind of dishonest. Uh, and throwing the audience off the trail, but I don't mind it so much because once the movie's over, I can kind of recontextualize it as Thomas and McKenzie's character, Eloise, uh, possibly seeing what she wants to see. Yeah, I think that's a bit of the key. Because I think a lot of this movie is her looking back at the 60s with what she wants to see. You know, she likes the music. She likes the time her mom grew up in, et cetera, et cetera. Or her grandma, you know, she likes all that stuff because her grandma showed her the old music and she likes the fashion from then and she likes the hairstyles and she likes what Sandy seemingly represents. And I think, therefore, uh, maybe looks at Sandy in a uh, possibly fairer light than she deserves. Yeah. And she's been told the city's dangerous for women. Right. 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 Yeah. And. And although a lot of terrible things happen to Sandy, I think it's safe to say that she's not necessarily a good person by the end of her adventures. No, I don't think so. But which, you know, I I, I had conflicting feelings and I think that's a I, I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing, but, you know, there was a moment where I thought the movie was going to take a, a direction that I didn't like. You know, where yeah. where all the ghouls are in, are in the bedroom and they're telling, you know, uh, Thomas and Mackenzie, help us, you know, stop her, help us, whatever it was they were saying. And yeah. I was like, that's 
I don't know if these people need to be helped, you know? No. And yeah. I like that she ends up saying like, no, I'm not going to help. And, um, but it is a weird, it is a weird thing that she then, you know, is, is kind of on the side of her and saying, you know, I understand why you did this or whatever, you know, like get out of the house, like save yourself as opposed to, it's weird. Cause she was just trying to kill her. I don't know. Yeah. That's all the stuff that like, I kind of had, the the turn where like Sandy's a victim and then it kind of I don't know that that whole thing's kind of messy to me. Well, it's like she's uh, still a victim no matter what. But also these terrible men, maybe like I don't know, did all of them deserve that fate? I don't know. You know, they don't know how she got into this life. Well, they didn't know she was forced by Matt Smith into it. You know what I mean? Like, or did they? I don't know. Yeah. They weren't great people, I don't think. I think I, I, I'm not sure. You know, obviously, we can't say every single one of them or whatever. Yeah, that's uh, what, we don't really know enough about these men to know whether or not Sandy was like a complete psychopath or if she was like an avenging angel in her own eyes. You know what I mean? Yeah, certainly she was an avenging angel in her own eyes, and like, you know, murder is never the best option. Um, <laughs> you know, and I'm not exactly sure why she she decides that she needs to kill Sandy at the end. Like, are there bodies buried in the, like, are the police actually going to listen to her when they tell her that she's living with Sandy, the murderer, you know, like, I don't think they're going to take Thomas and McKenzie's word, you know, like, so why does she decide that she's going to kill everybody? And I don't know that that ending is just kind of messy to me. And uh, I mean, you don't want people (laughs) snooping around either way, but I feel like killing Thomas and McKenzie and, and uh, her boyfriend would have the opposite effect of that. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of where it's yeah. all kind of weird. And well, I, I think it's certainly like it's self defense. You know, I, I think that kicks in. So like, I can kind of understand this. Like, not thinking, oh, she's she's crazy and she's like just a killer and evil. You know, um, I think it's this fight or flight sort of like uh, survival mode that kicks in. Um, both you know, in the present with the cops coming around and, and trying to kill Thomas and McKenzie. And then also in the past where I think I, I, my assumption is that she starts to be treated poorly by all these men and just like, and, and Matt Smith and all of these people. And then it's the same situation. She kills out of necessity, but then she knows I can't be caught. And like every, every action comes from there in a way that makes sense to me if I really think about it, but it, it's just, it's confusing. It's a lot of twists and turns in like a very short time. Yeah, exactly. Especially for Thomas and McKenzie's character to go from being chased and murdered, almost murdered by her to then. And poisoned. You know, poisoned. Oh, yeah. 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 Which was, that was actually one thing that I was a little confused on because I thought she was being poisoned and was going to die. And then she didn't, I well, guess she throws in the ambulance. Up. She throws up going up the stairs. Oh, does she? Yeah, she throws okay. up at one point. It's like very brief, and I was like, "Did she just throw up, or did she just spit out blood?" But ultimately, because she didn't die, I assume she threw up. Okay, I guess that makes sense. I didn't really pick up on that. But yeah, because yeah, I was like, "Why isn't she dead yet?" But uh, yeah, I I did enjoy all the look of the ghouls like the guys whenever they started showing up in like the real world like standing around and watching her you know it was very um yeah uh, carnival of souls inspired yeah, definitely yeah and um i did that's just a generally it's creepy in that movie it was creepy in this movie <laughs> i thought it worked and really i well. think i think that's the lens you need to go into this movie with right like this isn't trying to be hereditary or you know oh, what i mean right, or right. some artsy like a 24 type horror movie. This is going after like kind of trashy, weird horror, <laughs> like psychological horror of like carnival of souls, uh, repulsion, like A equally it's about someone losing their mind. Thing. Yeah. As much as it is like a, a fun ghost story. And it's not necessarily trying to reinvent the wheel, <laughs> you know? And I think that's, what's kind of just fun about this yeah. movie. Absolutely. More than anything. It's tra- it's not trying to reinvent the wheel. It's trying to take you back on the ride you haven't been on in in fifty years. <laughs> yeah, and for some younger audiences, maybe never. But I yeah. wonder if if people who haven't seen old movies like that, or even know what Jalo movies are, I wonder if 
this would be sort of lost on them or if they would like it. I don't know. I think I think that those sequences uh, of the past, like, um, you know, those are I think it's really good um, and worth watching for those. And that that the first two thirds of this movie, like we've been talking about, are like five star movie worth, you know, worthy, you know, type stuff. Uh, It just kind of falls apart in the end for me. Yeah, I think it stands on its own and then there's extra to get, you know. Yeah, that's fair. Like I, I. I thought I recognized some similar shots from um, the the scene where she f- first goes in to the club, uh, Anya Taylor Joy, and there's this shot um, looking to the guys that are sitting along with their chairs turned inside towards the dance floor as she's walking along, and there's a shot that goes along with them, and I'm pretty sure that's like a, a, a recreation of a shot from Godard's "A Woman Is a Woman," and like picking uh, up on that sort okay. of th- picking up on that sort of stuff is like just kind of icing on the cake of what is like a good movie already. Yeah. Maybe not great. Yeah. But it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And I don't know, like I, before I even rain my final judgment on the third act, cause like I, I kind of agree with a little bit of what Chris is saying, but also I think everything tracks, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know that any of it's bad. It's just a little surprising how fast everything goes to hell. <laughs> So yeah, it, it, it happens quickly. So I'm <laughs> got to digest it and probably see it again. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of where I'm at. I think it, it, it all tracks and stuff. I just, it's weird. And I don't know. I it just, I would watch it again and see, maybe my mind can be changed, but right now I'm sitting at like, it just doesn't work that last bit, you know, for me. Yeah. I can understand that. I mean, that's sort of an inherent thing with any movie with the with twists like this. Yeah. Is that it's yeah. going to work for some people. It's going to not work for other people. Yeah. For some people will be like, eh, it was whatever. It was still good. It'll, and yeah, it it'll be distracting to a significant <laughs> portion of your audience. Just the fact that it is such a twist. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and especially anybody who hears that there's a twist, you know, <laughs> that's waiting for it. It's, yeah. it's going to affect their, their watch of the movie. Um, yeah. But that's not why you go to this movie. Uh, I don't think uh, if, if you're still listening, <laughs> you know, uh, you go, Go for the those dance sequences. That's so great. Yeah, Edgar yeah. Wright needs so, to do a musical. Really, <laughs> I agree. So ultimately, though, I have a question: Is Sandy still a sympathetic uh, sympathetic character by the end of it? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Because I think she is pulled into the world that she ends up in via the promise of success. Yeah, and. Once she's in there, everything she does from there, as I said before, trickles out from this survival instinct where she probably feel fears for her physical well being or life and kills. Yeah. You know? Well, I, I definitely think that's the case with Jack. She when she kills Jack. But then I think at that point no one seems to be forcing her. She seems to just be in the life. And I think at that point she's she's I think from her own mind, she's like Batman or something like that. Or she's like, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, was Jack she's, the first she's person she killed? cleaning the streets I of scum so. and villainy. <laughs> you know, she's she's doing that. And and I think that's she starts out with like a noble cause of only wanting to kill people that she perceives as uh, deserving. But then later you get to the point, like we said earlier, with like she's killing Thomas and McKenzie or whomever, you know. Or maybe other tenants previous to her because she said she had people run off to her in the middle of the night. Yeah. So I, don't think I think that at that point of oh, go ahead, sorry. Well, I think at that point she's just so beaten down and ultimately changed by her experiences that she's willing to blur those lines of who who deserves it and who doesn't, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think the movie gives us enough to really go on uh like what happens during that segment of her life. She just killed a bunch of people, and that's kind of what the movie tells us that she was supposed to be sleeping with because they were paying money, right? Like, uh, and she like couldn't necessarily get out of that life. Whether Matt's, whether it was Matt Smith or somebody else, I don't know. But um, I, I just don't think we know enough to really make a judgment there on that. Yeah. yeah. I think there is sympathy for those characters to do the wrong thing, you, you know. For the right reasons. For the right reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, things like... Um, to use an example of a show I've never seen, but from what I understand, Dexter <laughs> is is that sort of thing. But or or you know, 
um, Charles Bronson in Death Wish or Jodie Foster in the Death Wish remake ish movie, The Brave One. Yeah. <laughs> um, Batman. And that's a, you know, sometimes it's not necessarily the vigilante's place to dish out law and order and be, uh, to use a line from another Edgar Wright film, Judge Judy and Ex- Executioner. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I guess I just wished we would have known more about the people who weren't Matt Smith that she was killing. Because, like, yeah. is everyone who ever goes to a prostitute deserving of death? I don't know. Probably not. Yeah. So she's definitely a gray character, even though yeah. I think the audience is okay sympathizing with her. I agree with and that. And I think that's ultimately where the movie lands. Yeah, I think so too. Because it, it sure. does want us to have some emotional uh, response to seeing her sitting there in the bedroom as it's burning. You know, yeah. I think there's a bit of sadness to that. Well, and we need to understand why she wants to sit there mm-hmm. instead of leaving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, who knows? Maybe maybe she realizes I'm not going to kill this innocent girl, and. If I don't kill her, then I'll be caught. Yeah. So I'll just go down with the ship or something. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so the, the one last thing that I have, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, the, this film is a lot of fun and I think that's what it does best. And it's, it's not this a 24 meditation on grief type horror movie, <laughs> but I think the film does say a lot about trauma and the trauma that we experience and how that stays with us and how we will always carry it with us. And I think that, you know, one of the reasons if I'm going to assign a reason that Thomas and McKenzie is able to do this, to get into this mirror world is, is her experience of her mother always being in the mirror, you know, her dead mother. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I feel like not that there needs to be logic of why she's able to enter this world, but that's just they go hand in hand of of this mirror world with the this the sixties that's on your Taylor Joy that's Sandy all that and this uh, her mother being in the mirror and then that ties in with like the end of the movie uh, the the last I think it's one of the last shots is um, Sandy on your Taylor Joy in the mirror now too because we see both her mother and her in that scene so now this experience even though it's done it's over it's passed with like this trauma will hang over her yeah. And and stay with her. And I, I like that Edgar Wright is is giving us a little bit more than I think this movie has way more than to to feel in that sense than you know Hot Fuzz or Shaun of the Dead or sure um, yeah. Baby Driver. And and so I appreciate that. Like while it is fun, it's a fun ghost story. There's a little bit extra to it that he normally doesn't have. Right. It's not just a happy ending where she becomes a fashion designer and has a really cool boyfriend who's understanding of everything that she could possibly do. And and so on. It's like there's a little bit of a darkness that she'll always carry around with her. And we also don't know to what extent she empathizes with Sandy. It could also be dangerous (laughs) that her and Sandy still seem to be on good terms. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. It's it's. We hope yeah. that you know we hope for the best, but we saw what the trauma did to Sandy, you know, and she's experienced Sandy's trauma firsthand almost. So, who knows? Yeah. Do I yeah, smell exactly. sequel? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's that, but you know, I mean, I mean, maybe in some way there's some like she's taken on some of Sandy's trauma too, just by knowing of it, yeah. right? Yeah. And I don't know that this film is getting that deep on trauma or anything in particular. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so do we have anything else? No, that's it for me. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm good. Okay. Cool. So that does it for this episode, right? I believe yep. so. Awesome. Well, thank you so much listener for listening. Thanks as always to Jake Wagner Russell for doing our intro and outro music. If you want to hear more of his music, you can do so at soundcloud.com slash popscotch. And thank you guys for talking movies with me again, as always. Absolutely. My Stay pleasure. tuned to this channel, this feed. Our next episode will be over Titan. Woohoo! Yeah, yeah. I'm excited to watch that one, I think. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I've yeah. heard a lot of things. 
<laughs> it's going to yeah. be a fun conversation no matter what. Yeah, excellent. I look forward to it. Yeah. We'll see you next time, guys. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.